Good morning, everyone. I just have a quick message from the call committee this morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Bishop Kevin Jones with us this morning. He will be providing the sermon as well as meeting down in the fellowship hall after worship to answer any questions there may be regarding the call process. So please join us for coffee, fellowship, and some words from the bishop this morning. Thank you. Passion for theater, right? Passion for the outdoors. Um, Jesus has a passion for who? Us, right? Jesus has a passion for us. And so Holy Week begins with us celebrating his coming into Jerusalem. And Easter Sunday celebrates um, his rising from the dead. What happens is if we just come and are happy and excited and do an Easter egg hunt and have lots of sweet gifts and, and raise palms and then come back ne next Easter, next week, saying, oh man, this is great. You have two really upbeat days in a row, which is good. But during the week, we, we, we hear the story of how Jesus died on the cross. And so the passion is about the opportunity to hear the story, the passion story. Um, and then some of our com um, First Communion kids will come back on Thursday, have a meal downstairs, have a foot washing, and then have your First Communion. Um, and then Friday, there's an opportunity to have um, what's called the Way of the Cross, a service where we can come together and extinguish candles as we hear again this story. But this is the opportunity to hear um, the story on Palm Passion Sunday. And so we're going to read it from um, the... Um, World Bible Story, and if you could hold this for me so I guess everybody can hear. This is the Palm story, Palm Sunday story. It's called Hosanna. It's um, from um, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you see here, this is why you got to get up close. Jesus is coming in on a donkey, right? And um, they're all excited and waving palm branches because the king is coming, right? Jerusalem was overflowing with people celebrating the Passover festival. Jesus waited to enter the town. He asked two disciples to bring him a young donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, the crowd in Jerusalem cheered. Jesus rode the donkey through the crowds. The people tossed coats and palm branches on the road to welcome him. Jesus, over here, a little boy shouted joyfully. The boy's sister waved a palm branch in the air. Hooray, it's Jesus. In the distance, religious leaders frowned. They worried about all this cheering and shouting and the waving of palms. What is Jesus doing, they grumbled. All this noise will get us in trouble with the Romans. The people were excited and pressed in to see Jesus. They sang songs and shouted praises. Blessed is Jesus. He comes in God's name. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Our king has come. Hooray. Hosanna. Can you try that? Because we're going to be loud. Hosanna. Oh, man, that was a wimpy. Hosanna. 
Awesome, there you go. The religious leaders glared. This crowd is too big. They are too many. They're too loud. They're too excited. You guys excited? Ooh, yeah. One of the leaders ran up to Jesus and shouted, Hey, tell this crowd to be quiet. Jesus looked down at the man. Even if every person was quiet, Jesus said, the stones would shout out. Well, the leader didn't know what Jesus was talking about, but frustrated, he stomped his way through the cheering crowd. So that's what we're acting out um, this morning as our congregation sings. Um, the Palm Sunday procession. So I know some of you are practiced and ready to um, um, say the verses that the congregation will respond in the bold as we begin our call to worship. So who starts? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes with healing and compassion. Blessed is the one Blessed is the one who brings peace. Blessed is the one who brings peace to the nations and peace to all peoples. Lord, rest your hand of healing on our hearts today. Gracious Jesus.
you to be seated. Thank you. Thank you for sharing a beautiful song. As I get seated, let's prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. O oh God of mercy and might, in the mystery of the passion of your Son, you offer your infinite life to the world. Gather us around the cross of Christ and preserve us until the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading today is from Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. 
Who will declare me guilty? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. God. on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my, my life is wasted with grief, and, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I am the scorn of my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. Like, like the dead, dead, I am forgotten, out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your the whispering of the crowd. Fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But when as for me, I have trusted, trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let, Let your face shine on your servant. servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. Passion according to Matthew. One of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. I, it would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, 
which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me at this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Truly I tell you this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what you want, not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then you, he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, 
The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send more than twelve legions of angels? But how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which, is, which say it must happen this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. <clears throat> Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Cephas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so they might put him to death but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of God seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Tell us who that struck you. Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl came and said to him, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. Then he went out to the porch. Another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. 
I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up to Pete and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them in the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used the money to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. salvation. 
Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him saying, Have nothing to do with this innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas. Then what should I do with the Jesus who is called the Messiah? Let, Let him be crucified. Why, what evil has he done? Let, Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. His, his blood, blood be on us and on our, our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took a reed and struck him on the head. And after mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put a charge against him which read, This is, this is Jesus, Jesus, the, the King, King of, of the, the Jews. Jews. Then the two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Then those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last.
At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother and sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Armathia named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in its own new tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise again. Therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers, go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. The The gospel gospel of of the Lord.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, Christ, our Redeemer, and the Spirit of our love and life. Amen. Amen. A couple days ago, my wife and I um, were watching Netflix. We watched uh, the new Pinocchio movie uh, by Guillermo del Toro, a uh, little bit grittier than the Disney version that I remember uh, from way back when. Uh, but um, following the movie, uh, Netflix had a documentary, a 30-minute documentary on the making of the movie. And uh, I don't know if you realize this movie is a stop-motion animation, and I, I love that kind of animation, so I thought I'd sit and watch how they made the movie. And um, in the midst of the documentary, the assistant director, Mark Gustafson, said this. This story of Pinocchio is a story about life. And you can't have a story about life without death. I thought, what appropriate words for this week. When I was growing up, this Sunday was always Palm Sunday, just Palm Sunday. And we would do exactly as you did. We'd process, sometimes with the kids, sometimes we would get these little crosses made out of palm leaves. Uh, and my brothers and I would sit and kind of shred them to pieces during the sermon uh, looking for something to do, but um, it was Palm Sunday. And then I realized, after being a pastor for a while, that this Passion Sunday was starting to kind of crowd in on it. And, and that pastors and worship teams were allowed to decide, are you going to focus on the Palm Sunday or are you going to focus on Passion Sunday? And I finally asked a group of pastors during a text study, why are we doing this Passion Sunday thing? Why not just Palm Sunday? And they explained that it was because fewer and fewer people were coming to Holy Week services on Thursday and Friday. And they weren't hearing the story, as Pastor Joel talked to the kids, about just showing up and hearing good news of uh, uh, Palm Sunday and then good news of Easter Sunday without hearing about the suffering and the death and why... Jesus went through that for us. I realize that there are reasons for that, right? Uh, when I started as a pastor 30 years ago, the small town that I was in literally shut down on Good Friday afternoon for an hour so that everybody could go to church. And that doesn't happen so much anymore. Now as families are uh, spread out over the state or over the country, a lot of families use Good Friday as a travel day to, to go to grandma and grandpa's house. Or now a lot of grandma and grandpas are going to see their grandkids where they are. And so Friday is a travel day for a lot of people. And let's be honest, sometimes people just decide not to come on Thursday and Friday because, well, you just, pastors at times have used this to, to use guilt and shame for people. And I think a lot of folks just feel like, why do I need to go to church to feel guilty or ashamed of who I am anymore? And so there's reasons that we don't come. And I'm not here to make people feel guilty or ashamed for not showing up during the week. But just realizing that what happens then is that you have this Palm Sunday celebration, Hosanna, the king, Jesus is the king. And then the next Sunday you show up and Jesus has triumphed over the grave. And we have this great big story, but nothing in between. We have a story of life without death. And that is never a true story of life. And the truth is, this gospel is a story of life. A story of life with death. And it's such an important part of who we are as Christians and Lutherans. 
that we embed it in so much of what we do. Our confession and forgiveness includes those words about dying and rising. It's in our prayers. It's in our hymns and songs. It's, it's embedded within our liturgy, and it's in our preaching. It's in our sacraments. Even though our Lutheran tradition is to bring young children to the font here, we use the language of dying and rising to new life, of drowning. And at the sacrament of the table, we talk about a body that is broken and blood that is shed for us, this death and new life, these sacraments that give us life. It's embedded in what we do. But because we do it week after week after week, sometimes those words lose their edge. They lose the power to hold our attention, to make us truly think about where that death is and what it means for us. And then what new life means after a real death and a dying of the self. And so I think that maybe Passion Sunday and Holy Week are a way for us to think about this a little bit more than we normally do. Normally we like to skip over the death parts and just stay in the good feeling parts. But it's important for us, I think, some days to sit in the presence of death a little bit longer. In the movie Pinocchio, the wooden boy learns that he can die. And when he's dead, he's talking to this character named Death. And Death reveals to him that his particular energy for life is not like a human being's energy for life. It's not like a mortal. Mortals die, but Pinocchio could come back to life. But Death said that there are some rules. <laughs> And one of the rules is that every time he would die, he had to spend a longer time in the presence of death. And so there was a series of hourglasses, each one getting bigger, and so that each time he died, he had to stay longer to wait for the sand to fall through the hourglass. I think Passion Sunday and Holy Week are opportunities for us to sit longer in the presence of death. But my friends, the good news is that we don't sit there alone. We sit there as part of the body of Christ. We, we dwell in the presence of death as the body of Christ in this world, crucified and risen. Jesus dies so that we are not alone in death, that Christ goes with us through death, our own death, those times of death when someone near us die, those times in life where parts of our life we have to let go so that something new can be born and raised up to new life. That's the good news, that God loves us so much, that God will not let anything, not even death, come between us, come between God and us. Paul says, and I hope that you hear with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, deep in your bones, this truth of the scriptures, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing that you've ever said or done, nothing that you ever could say or ever do can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's nothing about who you are, how you understand yourself to be in this world that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that there's nothing that anybody else has ever said about you or to you or done to you or anything that anybody can do that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not because of us, but because of who God is and how strongly God loves us and wants to be with us. There's nothing, not height, nor depth, not powers, nor principalities, nor anything else in this world. My friends, not even death itself.
can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so we can dwell in the presence of death. But we dwell in that presence with the presence of Christ. That living, animating, breathing, creating, resurrecting power of God to lift us up to new life today and forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church and the world and all of creation. Save your church, O God. Enable us to boldly confess in every time and place that Jesus Christ is Lord. With the humility of a servant, equip congregations, synods, and other ministry settings to proclaim your extravagant love for all. Merciful God, receive us. Save your creation, O God. Every living being you have made has purpose. Give us renewed appreciation of farm animals who labor in the fields, service animals who accompany their human companions, and beloved pets who live alongside us. Merciful God. Save the peoples of the earth, O God. Restore dignity to those who are scorned and persecuted for their religious beliefs or political activism, and deliver them from the hand of their enemies. Bring peace to places where conflict runs deep. Merciful God. Save those who cry to you in any need, O God. Watch over all who are incarcerated or awaiting trial, and stand with those who are unjustly accused. Be present with those feeling isolated, lonely, or fearful. Merciful God. Save us in your love, O God. Guide the work of the church musicians, pastors, choirs, readers, deacons, technicians, acolytes, and all who assist in worship. Sustain them in their leadership as they accompany congregations through this holy week. Merciful God. Save us, loving God. You created us, male and female, with the purpose to be in partnership with one another. Bless family life everywhere and fill all homes with respect, peace, and harmony, good health, and safety. Teach us to mirror the unconditional love, forgiveness, and nurture you desire for the whole human family. We pray this week for Dennis Trustheim, Mitchell and Wesley Turnbull, Paisley, Merritt, and Crystal Foley, Greg and Julie Turvald, Barbara Tweed, and Doris Tweed. S merciful God, save us at last, O oh God. We give you thanks for your saints of old who embodied your servant love. As you came to their aid, so deliver us in times of trial, that every knee would bend in Praise to you, merciful God. Receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Thank you, Ruth. Let us pray. God of good gifts, receive these in all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. Let us pray as our Father taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. in peace, serve in love. Thanks, Thanks be to God. To God. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Good. How about you? Good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.